Welcome to API Authors Humanizing Our History, a conversation with Julie Otsuka and Tom Ikeda. My name is MJ Wong Engel, and I am the co-chair of the API Coalition of Wisconsin Education Committee. We are so thrilled to have all of you joining us here tonight. Throughout the program, you will hear from several members of the AAPI Coalition of Wisconsin, and I am thrilled to introduce our next AAPI Coalition leader, Kavi Hong, who will share the background on how this event came to be. Kavi Hong, if you don't know him yet, you are about to be wowed. Kavi is a superstar. He is an English teacher in the Verona School District, and was the first Asian American to be honored as the Wisconsin Teacher of the Year in 2022, this year. He teaches ninth grade English and AP language and composition. His students have been featured in the New York Times and he has received teaching awards from Stanford University and the University of Chicago. So please join me in welcoming Kavi Hong. Thank you, MJ, for that very kind introduction. We are here in large part because of what happened in Muskego, Wisconsin this summer, but we are also here to talk about books, historical truth, and visibility for Asian Americans. Earlier this year, the Muskego School Board rejected the recommendation of their own English teachers to teach Julie Otsuka's novel, When the Emperor Was Divine. The novel chronicles a Japanese American family's experience of being unjustly incarcerated during World War II and held in an internment camp. Board members justified their rejection by saying the book was too sad, too poetic, didn't show the quote, American perspective, unquote, and didn't provide balance by showing the war crimes the Japanese government committed during World War II. In July of this year, the AAPI coalition and local community members like the incredible Ann Zilke held a community teaching event outside the Muskego School Board meeting. The teaching event was to protest the board's decision and to educate the community about the Japanese American internment during World War II. At our teaching event, which drew more than 150 people, we had Ann Zilke, a parent, speak along with former Muskego teachers and students. I also spoke, but the most impactful speech by far came from Ron Kuramoto, president of the Wisconsin chapter of the Japanese American Citizens League, who spoke about his own family's experiences during the incarceration. The AAPI coalition raised money to distribute 100 books, uh, 100 copies of the novel free of charge, and we work to help set up a Muskego Community Book Club. Today's discussion is about Muskego, but it's about a much bigger issue, and that's the lack of visibility for AAPI people in school curriculums, the attack on teachers, and the politicization of our nation's history. Wisconsin currently has a bipartisan bill that would require AAPI history in Wisconsin schools, that has been stuck in education committee for the last two years. We are hoping to move this important bill forward as more and more people see the need for AAPI visibility. With that, it is now my honor and pleasure to introduce Ron Kuramoto. Thank you, Kavi. Hello, my name is Ron Kuramoto and I'm president of the Japanese American Citizens League Wisconsin chapter and also a member of the AAPI Coalition of Wisconsin. Uh, it is my great privilege to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Tom Ikeda. Tom Ikeda is retiring after 26 years as the founding executive director of Densho, a Seattle-based organization that utilizes digital technology to preserve and make accessible primary materials from the World War II mass incarceration of Japanese Americans. Um, Tom was inspired to help launch Densho, which roughly translates as, quote, to pass on to the next generation, unquote, after participating in a series of oral history interviews with Nisei, who had lived through the war. 
In general, the Nisei were stoic and reluctant to discuss their experiences, which often included the loss of their homes and family businesses and racist treatment from the government and other Americans. Quote, what I could see was how these were hidden stories of being rejected by their frightened country were a source of deep pain and suffering, um, Tom recalled. Tom is a Sansei whose own parents and grandparents were imprisoned at Mindanoka, Idaho concentration camp. Um, Tom, with support from the Japanese American Chamber of Commerce of Washington State and others, created Densho in 1996, the organization that uh, we will be hearing much more. Tom himself has conducted over 200 interviews. Quote, the stories that many Americans would just as soon forget, uh, Tom explains. Densho's mission is to share these stories so we remember the mistakes to the past and promote equity and justice over racism and bigotry today and in the future. Tom has said before, quote, we are really interested in a treasure that is still waiting to be discovered by people in the academic world. Densho's archives contain more than 1100, uh, 111,000 photos and objects, as well as thousands of hours of video interviews. Densho exists to share the true stories of incarcerated Japanese Americans in hopes of creating a better future. History doesn't repeat itself, but it sometimes rhymes, unquote. On a more personal note, um, I know Tom is truly dedicated to doing this presentation because he is an enthusiastic Seattle Seahawks football fan who are playing right now as we speak. So Tom, appreciate you uh, dropping in. So it, without further ado, it's both a pleasure and honor to introduce Mr. Tom Ikeda. Thank you, Ron, so much for that introduction <clears throat> and dropping in that Seahawk line. It made, it made me kind of laugh and, and chuckle as you, as you said that. But yeah, thank you so much for that in-depth, uh, warm uh, introduction. And MJ and Gabby, thank you so much for setting the context for this conversation. Now, Julie, why don't you come on, on screen and we can uh, sort of just dive into this. Um, and uh, because in some ways, I'm really excited for these next 30 minutes because when I thought about um, what we're going to do today, you know, I realize we're actually sort of continuing a conversation we've been having for over the last 17 years about, about uh, when the emperor was divine. I mean, since then, you wrote two other novels. And so you have, you know, these three novels, you know, when the emperor was divine back in 2002, uh, the Buddha in the attic, and then most recently, the swimmers, all three highly acclaimed. But today, we're going to focus on your first novel, when the Emperor Was Divine, which again was published in 2002, which I think is going to be important as we talk about this. You know, you know, to, to set a context, um, you know, I kind of went back through some of my older notes um, that I, I wanted to share before we kind of continue our conversation. And you know, something that I've I've kind of learned and appreciate even more over the years was how it is to really, you know, have a piece of literary work to become highly acclaimed. And um, you know, I've grown in appreciation, you know, to get a good book review from the uh, New York Times reviewer, uh, Michiko Kakutani, that, that is not to be taken for granted. I've talked to so many authors who have said that is something very difficult to do. And yet when your book came out, um, you know, she gave you high praise. I mean, she said, you know, Ms. Otsuka's precise but poetic evocation of the ordinary lends the slender novel its mesmerizing power. She, she went on to praise that your lyric gifts and narrative poise, her heat-seeking eye for detail, her effortless ability to empathize with her characters. You know, these were all words that uh, she, um, she wrote uh, about when the emperor was divine. And again, very high praise. And over the years, I've noticed, you know, you've, you've received a lot of praise for your writing in terms of your, your literary skills. But I think, and in, in what's important for this conversation is your work has extended beyond just the, the literary circles. Um, there was something else that, that um, I wanted to you know, bring to the attention of this audience in particular. Um, when it comes to education, um, again, I mentioned earlier how your book came out in 2002. So this was a year after um, you know, the terrorist acts on, you know, of 
you know, which was in 2001. And there was something that the New York Times education writer, Samuel uh, G. Uh, Friedman wrote. He wrote, what has happened with emperor is what no one in publishing or education can predict. The way an accomplished work of art, though set in the past, captures something essential about the present day. You know, Friedman further went on to compare the impact of your book to the debuts for Lord of the Flies and also you know, To Kill a Mockingbird. You know, books that are just staples of you know, the curriculum in high schools, middle schools, and in colleges. So yeah, I just wanted to start with that because I want people to understand a little bit, for, especially for those who haven't read it, how, how it is such a powerful literary work but also in terms of the impact it's had in, in education over the years. But to start our conversation, I actually wanted to revisit uh, how we first met. And so I wanna take you back to 2005 when you visited Seattle. And I'm actually going to, for the purposes, I, and, and you haven't seen this, Julie. Uh, so this is a photo that of you back in 2005 um, when you, you did visit uh, Seattle, we actually did an oral history. And so that's you uh, almost, well, I guess, 17 years ago when we first started talking. Uh, but what I want to uh, you know, ask you, Julie, 2005, the, the book has been out uh, for now a, you know, a couple of years. And uh, Seattle um, um, you know, brought you, you know, the Seattle Public Library brought you to Seattle so they could feature When the Emperor Was Divine for its Seattle Reads program. And I guess the question is, what were some highlights from that trip? It was actually an overwhelming experience. It was my first community read. And up until then, I think I'd had fairly small audiences. Um, and I never, I never met so many older Japanese Americans who'd actually been incarcerated in the camps in my audiences until I got to Seattle. And you know, I wrote my book basically in solitary in my corner of my neighborhood cafe in New York City. It took me six years to write. So to meet the people that I've been thinking about and dreaming about and writing about for six years in person was just, it was very, very humbling. And they all had stories to tell. And I think the one fear that I had while I was writing my book was, will it ring true to those who were actually incarcerated in the camps? And I think unlike you, Tom, I didn't grow up um, in a Japanese American community. So it was really wonderful to be with these folks um, and just to have them show up. And um, I was just, I was very, very moved actually by by all of the Seattle audiences. Yeah, I, I remember that day vividly. Um, it was actually at the Seattle Public Library branch that I went to as a, as a, as a child. And they had you know, a, a large room for um, the uh, you know the audience, and it was overflowing. It 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 actually surprised um, you know me and Dencho um, as well as the Seattle Public Library. How many people showed up? And I believe there were like three dozen uh, older Japanese Americans Niseis. And like you, I, I I talked with many of them to find out, um, and, and they were just part of a larger audience. So they're probably a you know, hundred plus people just, just overflowing this room. And what I remember asking people was, um, you know, one, they were so um, excited that this new book had come out and it was being highly acclaimed. But for those who read it, it, it just felt so, it, it, it really connected with them in ways that um, I think other books had not so much. I mean, a lot of the, the, the books written about the World War II Japanese American incarceration tended to be nonfiction and very factual. This is what happened. Your, your book struck a chord with many people in the community that I had never seen before. And, and I'm sure you felt some of that too. Yeah, it was, you know, people would come up to me afterwards and they would just start telling me their own family stories. And um, I, you know, I think. I think fiction is really powerful in a way that documentaries and history books are not in that it kind of really slows you down, just slows down time and it kind of airdrops you into a certain moment in time. And I think, I mean, I guess what I tried to do was really create characters that the readers would care about. Um, and that was my way of 
drawing all reader, not just Japanese Americans, but but anybody, you know, into the novel. But just to just to meet these older folks, it just kind of blew me away, actually. <laughs> Um, and some of them would come up to me and say, thank you. And I just thought, well, you're thanking me. I should be really thanking you. You know, I'm just so grateful that I got to meet them. And I'm honored that I had the chance to tell their story. Yeah, I, I have that same experience as when I do oral histories with them. And they're so thankful. And, and I feel the same you know, gratitude that, you know, they, they are sharing a story that in many ways they don't think was a big deal. But then it, it, it very much is. Um, you know, in, in thinking about that trip, um, you know, I mentioned earlier, I showed that photograph, um, you know, from um, the oral history um, I did with you. And one of the things that, that struck me was, you know, although the book came out like a year after 9-11, you, you finished the book, uh, you know, before, um, you, know, the, uh, you know, the Twin Towers came down in New York. And, and your thoughts for the book wasn't to tell like a big story in terms of, the impact of the incarceration on, on you know, the country or anything like that. It was just a very personal uh, piece. And I, I was struck because by the time we had the, the interview, I would say, oh, this is, this, is one of, this is gonna be one of the defining literary works about the incarceration. And I was in kind of awe with, with, you, know, with you and your work. But then you told me it was, this was just like a personal piece for you. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I, I mean, I didn't even know if the novel would find a publisher or not. It was, I mean, 20 years ago, the literary landscape was very, very different. There were not a lot of writers of color, especially Asian American writers of color getting published. So I was really writing the book, actually not to make a political statement, but just as a way of trying to understand my mother and what she and her family had gone through during the war. So it was really a very personal labor of love. Um, and so I was... You know, and the, the book got very good reviews and it just very slowly started to pick up with schools, but it didn't start right away. I think it was a couple years after the book came out that Simmons College was the first school to, to pick up the book and use it as um, incoming common read. Um, and it's just, I, as a writer, you never know what kind of life your, your, your book is going to have. And I didn't think, I didn't even dream that I would have an audience someday. It was just... I, I was just really just trying to tell a story really for myself. I think I was my first audience or maybe I was writing the book for the young person that I was, you know, who grew up really knowing very little about what had happened during World War II. And um, so it's it's been quite a surprise to me too, how, you know, just the evolution of the book and how it's been received by readers. Well, and although the book is is a novel, it's fiction, um, you know, what I learned, you know, in that interview was that there were a lot of similarities to your mother's family. And uh, so talk about that. Share some of your mother's family story during World War II. Yeah, so my grandfather was arrested. Uh, he, he, the, the family lived in Berkeley, California, and he worked in San Francisco as a general manager of an import-export company. So the day after Pearl Harbor was bombed, he went to work on Monday and he never came home. So he'd been arrested as the, you know, by the FBI as a dangerous enemy alien. And then several months later, uh, my mother, who was 10, her younger brother, who was eight, and their mother, um, along with 120,000 other Japanese Americans, were incarcerated. Um, and my family went first to, I think you have a photograph of this, um, the Tamferan Assembly Center, which was a racetrack in San Bruno in uh, it was right south of San Francisco. And this is a photograph by Dorothea Lang that was taken of my family. And it was actually found in 2006, about 800 of her photographs that had just been lying dormant in the National Archives kind of resurfaced. And these photos had initially been impounded by the government because Dorothea Lang was considered to be too sympathetic to the Japanese Americans. But once they were discovered, rediscovered, they were posted online and we found this photograph. So you can see this large concrete structure in the background. And that is the grandstands at the horse racetrack at the Tamferan racetrack. And you can see some boarded up windows in the background. I think that's where the bets were placed, the betting windows. My grandmother is that woman, she's wearing a very nice wool coat. 
and a hat and she's speaking the man to her left is Mr. Oye and he'd arrived several days earlier according to my uncle who's now I think 89 and somewhere out there in the audience um and Mr. Oye was telling my grandmother uh where the mess hall was where the barracks were now most of the Japanese Americans at Tamfran were housed in the uh horse stalls which had only recently been whitewashed and were they were just filthy and they they stank. It was very, just very, very difficult living conditions. Uh, my grandmother and my mother and my uncle, however, were fortunate in that they were housed in the newly built barracks in the middle of the racetrack. Um, so my mother is behind my uncle. You can see she's got two braids wrapped up around the top of her head. And my uncle is what she's carrying his mother's purse for her underneath one arm. And then around his neck, he's wearing, it's a mess kit um, with probably pl uh, plates, some tin plates and utensils. Why? Because he's going to camp. So I think that he possibly had a different kind of camp in mind, the kind of camp where you take hikes and pitch tents. Um, and I think he's just really, he's just beginning to realize that this is not that kind of camp. And I just the look on his face is just one of he just looks very alarmed. And it was actually amazing to find this photograph several years after I'd written the novel. Um, it was kind of chilling, actually. And um, it's I, I also have a letter that's dated. So this photograph was taken, according to Dorothy Lang, on April 29th, 1942. So I have a letter that was written by my mother. Uh, about five or six days later. Um, and so they've arrived at Tamfran. And so, so they were living in building 82, apartment four. And she's writing, so she's 10, and she's writing a letter to her father, who at that point had been sent to Missoula, Montana. And so you can see a stamp on the bottom of the letter that says detained alien enemy mail exam. And so Every piece of ingoing and outgoing mail was was uh, was read by the censors. Um, so my mother says, "Dear Father, how are you getting along in Missoula? I am in the Tamfran Assembly Center now. I have to get up very early every morning. I wake up at six thirty. At lunch, I eat at eleven. Dinner is at four thirty or five. I reached here Friday morning, May first, at ten thirty." I think we are going to stay here a few months and move again. I have been thinking of writing to you, but I was so sleepy. We have to go to sleep early too. I hope you will come home soon. Your daughter, Haruko Alice Nozaka. And that letter just killed me. <laughs> I, I love reading primary sources. I love reading lettery, letters and diary entries because you really get a sense of just very ordinary people who are, have just been thrust into an extraordinary circumstance. And what I love about children and writing about children is that they still have a sense of hope. I don't think she quite realizes how dire the situation is. And she still has hope that her father will come home wherever home is at that point soon and that they'll be uh, eventually reunited, but it would be another couple of years before she ever saw her father again. Um, so Growing up, you know, there were clues around the house to what we called camp, but we I remember we had these old forks in the back of the silverware drawer, um, and they were inscribed on the handles with our family's uh, government-issued ID number. It was 13611, and we just called them our camp forks, and they were the forks of last resort. <laughs> when all the good forks were in the dishwasher, we would use the, the camp forks. And I didn't think twice about why they were called camp forks. And we had also these sleeping bags that my grandfather had been issued in one of the Department of Justice camps where he'd been imprisoned. And we would just play on them as, as kids, you know. And we also had, this, so my grandfather, when he was, he was eventually reunited with the family at, in Topaz at the end of 1943, he was paroled. I think from Santa Fe, New Mexico and allowed to rejoin the family. So he had been the director because he had business ex experience of the Topaz Cooperative. So we just had all this stationery. Um, it's carbon paper stationery from the co-op lying around that we would draw on and, pl and just play with as kids. And we again, we just didn't realize where it had come from. So you can see even as children, 
So the name of our club was the Secret Spy Club. So it was me, my two brothers, Michael and David, and Tommy Yoder, who was the blonde, curly-headed boy who lived next door to us in Palo Alto. But we, even then as children, we'd somehow picked up, absorbed the trope of, you can see I'm sneaky spy. So we'd somehow just picked up on that stereotype of the Japanese as being sneaky spies, even as kids. Um, but we were very, I think, oblivious to what it was that had happened in the past. And even though that there were clues just all around us um, to, to what had happened, but it really wasn't spoken about in an overt way in my family home. And it wasn't until I was a little bit older that I began to, to sort of understand what camp was and what it was that had happened to my family. No, I, I, I love that too. You know, thank you for sharing. And, and it, I, I think it's really you know, helpful for me, I think others to know in some ways, kind of the source material for your work. I mean, um, you know, over the years, I've, I've really um, appreciated the level of research you do uh, for your work. It's it's very thoughtful, and and your ability to, to really kind of refine it in, in such a poetic um, sense. The the other thing I I re remembered, and I saw a little bit uh, when you're describing the photograph. Um, uh, from Tanfran of your family. Um, you know, the other thing about your writing that I think really has resonated with, you know, not only your readers, but people from the community is you're so visual. I, th I think for many of the Japanese Americans who actually experienced it, the way you described uh, things were such that it, it, it brought back memories for, for many of the people who uh, lived through the experience. And it, and, you know, I, I know you trained as a as an artist, as a painter, before you became a writer. What was the influence of that in terms of your writing? Oh, I think I think very much in pictures. At least for this book, um, I I almost felt like I was a camera, just following the characters around. And I actually, and I I, I did a ton of research for the novel because I realized that I actually knew a lot less about the incarceration than I thought I did, even though. You know, I could ask my mother some questions about what she remembered of that time. Um, but I, I also looked at a lot of Dorothea Lange photographs. Um, there were a lot of, there's a lot of artwork that came out of the camps. Um, and I also looked at just newspapers from the early 1940s, which were just a great source of atmospheric detail. You can get this, the radio, you know, schedules and you can look at, you can see how much things cost. And, but I, I think that I'm, I'm obsessed with little details. I think that's just how I somehow process the world. I'm not like a big picture person. I just, I really, I think I'm kind of a pointillist, you know, I just, I, I just gather a, a lot of, just a lot of data. And from these different points of information, I put together a bigger picture. Um, but I was very much, you know, the desert was almost like another character in the novel. And I was very interested in, in just how things looked and just trying to paint a picture somehow with words. You know, in that detail, you know, I've um, I've now done like 250 oral histories, and and so it's the oftentimes the detail in um, those stories that you know always stay with me and change me. But I'm going to show another photograph. As you were talking, I I, I wasn't sure if I was going to show this, but uh, after what you just said, I'm going I am going to show this. So I'm going to share the screen again, and uh, this next photograph. Um, is um, a personal photograph uh, from my mother's my mother's collection, and it's a memorial service at the uh, Minidoka Idaho um, WRA camp, and uh, which most people from Seattle uh, were incarcerated. And in terms of detail, you you can you know you look at you know people dressed in dark and and at this memorial service, um, um, which you know is on this sort of dusty um, sort of uh, fire break between the, the barracks. But in terms of detail, if you look at the lower left-hand corner, uh, you see two children who are playing in the, in the dirt. And, um, and what strikes me about this um, you know, photograph, um, you know, today those two children would be in their uh, you know, late 80s. Yeah. And these are the type of people that 
um, if you find someone who was alive um, who could talk about the World War II camp experience, um, you know, they would be kind of children. And their perspective, you know, when the war was happening is so different than the, you know, the, the, I look at the faces of, of the Issei, you know, the older ones and the pain that they have. And it's such a contrast. And this photograph, you know, I've looked at a lot because um, this photograph, um, this next one is a photograph of my grandparents um, who are accepting the American flag because their eldest son, you know, my mother's oldest brother was killed in action, you know, fighting for the US Army in Europe with the uh, segregated 442nd unit. Um, and, you know, we, we weren't going to try to do a, a history lesson, but, you know, I, I did want to kind of talk about, um, um, you know, the impact on communities. I mean, you know, during World War II, on the home front, you know, American families all across the country were, were dealing with similar issues of their you know, sons being killed in action and, and being accepted. But in the case of my grandparents, um, you know, they had to accept the, the flag in a American concentration camp. And, um, and furthermore, the flag was given to them by another Japanese immigrant, another Issei. And you know, I remember having this conversation with my father. I said, so why, you know, was it because there were no military people there that could give them the flag? And my, and my father said, no, they were, there were lots of military officials, soldiers. They were just on the perimeter kind of guarding the people, um, uh, but no officer uh, came forward to actually give the, you know, the parents, you know, the, the flag, which was, you know, you know, for a, a war hero. So it, this has always stuck with me in terms of the story and, and it's these little details that, um, because we, we do the broad brush of, you know, this, you know, this mass uh, violation of civil liberties of 120,000 plus, um, you know, uh, you know, Americans and residents, legal residents of the, of the United States and how could this have happened? And, and yet it comes down to these personal details, these, these small details on a personal level that, that always impact, you know, impact, um, you know, us, especially, um, and in, in many ways like you, we're sharing this um, to really put a, a face to, you know, what really happened rather than it just being like this thing about uh, just uh, from a historical sense, the numbers and, um, and, 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 and what happened with those large numbers. Um, anyway, so I, I, I kind of rambled there a little bit. I just sort of wanted to show that because when you talked about, you know, kind of in some ways those details, uh, you know, that, that really came uh, to mind. Um, you know, in, in terms of continuing our conversation, you know, when we first talked, it, you know, the, the book was a hit. It was getting, you know, high critical acclaim. I, I'm curious how the book has done over time. Can you tell me kind of what, um, how it's done in terms of like, things like book sales or perhaps how other schools and communities have kind of done, you know, community reads type of programs? Yeah, so it's, it's sold over half a million copies and over 70 schools and universities, colleges and universities have used it as the common read. Um, and over 35 communities have used it as a common read, uh, including in 2020, Waukesha, Wisconsin, which is right down the road from Muskego. Um, so it's been used uh, as a state read by the state of Vermont, um, the territory, territory of the, the Northern Mariana Islands used the book. So it's really, um, it's been read everywhere all across the country. And I've traveled a lot uh, and just met many different audiences for the book. And I think one thing that surprised me was when I, when I first started speaking to students about the novel, when it came out, a lot of them yeah, had never heard of the incarceration. And 20 years later, a lot of them have still never heard of the incarceration, which just tells me that there's a huge gap in the education of our young people that still needs to be filled. Um, I thought, you know, by now, more, more people would know about it and more do, but I think still many, many do not. 
Um, so that's one thing that really has not changed that much since the novel came out. Yeah, and, and that's why I think it's so important that we have these kind of conversations. I mean, in terms of not of people not, you know, either hearing or remembering what happened. Um, you know, I, I think about, uh, and I'd be remiss to not mention this. So you know, I mentioned the 120,000 uh, Japanese Americans who were uh, removed from their homes and uh, incarcerated during World War II. Um, you know, I should you know, mention that, you know, again, no due process for these, these individuals. You know, they were uh, taken without the um, benefit of a hearing or a, a trial. Um, which was, you know, kind of, you know, against the crux of, of I think our, our legal system. Um, you know, furthermore, um, you know, in terms of I think this sort of um, is important today, and and we'll get into this a little bit more in terms of why it's important. You know, uh, the story is today, but um, you know, what's important is the reason given to remove Japanese Americans during World War II was really in some ways a, a, a false flag, um, that there were um, a lot of rumors that were being spread, um, painting Japanese Americans as being subversive, dangerous, uh, had to remove, although there was no hard evidence. You know, all the intelligence um, agencies like Naval Intelligence, the FBI, um, would, would look at these rumors and find out, oh, they're all false. But regardless of that, there was such, um, um, you know, such a, an uproar in the media and with politicians who just you know, played on the fear factor that that was, you know, the, the real cause. So although it was stated that there was a military necessity to remove Japanese Americans from the West Coast, um, there really was uh, no evidence. And, and in the 1980s, so this is like 40 years after the fact, uh, the, the U.S. government did something extraordinary. They, they did a federal commission to really look into this. And their findings were, as I stated, there was no military necessity. The real reasons, the causes of this, this, this civil liberties violation was you know, racism, uh, you know, fear or war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. And with that, um, the government apologized. And so Ronald Reagan um, signed the 1988 Civil Liberties Act, which apologized. Um, and, and Reagan uh, um, said some very powerful words. I, I, um, and I'll paraphrase, but he, you know, he just said that um, it was a, a wrong thing and that you know, we needed to know this so that we wouldn't repeat this again. And um, at that point, I, I had um, a lot of hope in terms of, of of what was happening. And that's part of, Julie, I think what you do in the work of Dan Show is to bring these stories out so that people don't forget um, that these things happen. And, um, and um, but going back to you know, some of the responses, I, I know you do these like community reads. Can you share some of, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about kind of the large numbers over half a million so. What are some of the responses from individuals, maybe especially from students, in terms of what they thought about the book or the impact of the book? Yeah, so I pulled out a, a couple of quotes, actually. So I, I've just received, I don't know, scores of letters uh, from students, high school students usually over the years. Um, so, um, so I wanted to read just a short excerpt from, this is a letter from a high school student in Michigan who'd been asked to read a book regarding social justice and she chose When the Emperor Was Divine. So she said, in all honesty, my motivation to read your book was the page number length. <laughs> I noticed it was shorter than other books, so I decided to try it out. However, after reading the first couple pages, I forgot about the page number entirely. Now, this is why I love kids, because they are so honest sometimes. <laughs> um, but then she went on to say that she ended up connecting very strongly to the girl and the story and kept on turning the pages because, as she put it, she wanted to see what happened next. And I think that's the, that's the power of story to draw kids in. The story had nothing to do with anything that she'd ever lived. Um, and yet she was really able to step into the, into the book. Um, so I, I also occasionally receive letters like this one. He's a young Chinese American boy in Massachusetts. Dear Otsuka, he wrote, 
You wrote about me and when the emperor was divine. As an Asian American, I never pictured characters who were dark haired with brown eyes and olive skin. I always imagined characters with fair skin and blue eyes. The young girl's experiences brought back painful memories of my childhood of kids running away from me on playgrounds because of my Chinese American features. And this note, it just broke my heart um, because I know that when I was growing up, I, I didn't read a single book written by somebody who looked like me or that was about somebody who looked like me. And to think that, you know, that was still the case all these years later uh, was a little discouraging. Um, but I think that I, I feel like I wrote my novel for both of these kids, for the girl in Michigan for whom the book was a window into somebody else's life and for the boy in Massachusetts for whom the book was a mirror. And he'd never seen himself reflected in a narrative before he'd read my book. Um, and I also, I have an excerpt from a letter uh, written by somebody much older. Um, he said, I am an old man who grew up in Western Washington state. My childhood was spent hating the Japanese as we were taught to do on the radio in school and at the movies. That hatred was based on fear. And then he went on to say how much he loved the novel. He loved it so much that he went out and he bought my second book. And then he wrote all of his surviving high school classmates. This is the class of 1955 about my books. And he, and he just, he, he said he was glad to have lost his hatred and he wished me well. So thank you, Don Martin. <laughs> Um, so I, I get letters like these, and it's just, it's so amazing to me that a book could just affect people in, in the real world, you know, it's, I, I feel really, I feel very, very fortunate as an author to, to be able to meet some of my readers in this way. It's just, it's been quite unusual and quite, um, you know, quite validating in a way. I, it just makes me think that the story that I was trying to tell, you know, made a difference in some way to people. Yeah. So, 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 Julia, Amy, our thirty minutes are up, and uh, I just got a note from the moderator that we have to go to Q and A. But you know, thank you so much for the time, and and you know, I I love those those three last you know, messages, and in the same way, you know, when, when I read the book, there were there were parts where you know I you know, I literally cried because it it just is so powerful, and in particular, there's some scenes you know from or passages, you know, from the, the young boy's perspective that I said, oh, I would have done the exact same thing. It's just very, very powerful. So with that, let's, let's bring, I think Macy is going to maybe join us and do Q&A. Thank you, Tom. And I, I so very much enjoyed the conversation that uh, the two of you had, Tom and Julie. And so I, I have now the distinct honor of uh, asking some questions of Julie um, from AAPI Coalition as one of its members. And uh, so my, and then some of the questions could very well be also, Tom, you could very much um, answer those too, but I'll, uh, I'll leave that to you, the two of you to see, um, you know, if, if Julie feels that she could answer it if she wants to pass it on to you. But, and I think that the last response you gave there, Julie, um, kind of gets at that first question I wanted to ask, but if you could just extend a little bit on it. When you initially wrote this novel in 2002, what, what audiences were you seeking to attract and what were you hoping they would learn? And has that audience changed or evolved since then? You know, honestly, I was not thinking about an audience at all. I think I, I always write for an audience of one and I think that's for myself. Um, and like I said, also for my younger self, I was writing the story that I didn't get to read as a child. Um, and it also seemed, it just, I, I didn't dream that I would ever have an audience. I really, I just, I honestly didn't know if this book was going to ever see the light of day. So, um, and maybe another audience member would be my mother um, who was, right when I began to write the novel, she was beginning her descent into dementia. So it was a way of trying to somehow keep her memories alive on the page. Um, but in terms of actual real world audiences that I had, you know, my, you know, I think, the difference between now and then is then, as in Seattle, there were so many survivors of the camps left. And now, you know, if I meet Japanese Americans, it's usually the, you know, sons and daughters, grandsons, granddaughters, grandchildren, great, great grandchildren as survivors of the camps. And um, I don't think I realized 20 years ago that those people would be gone. Of course they would be gone, but, um, um, 
it just seems like every day, you know, there are fewer and fewer of the survivors left. And uh, with each person who leaves us, it's just an entire world just vanishes. You know, each person has so many stories to tell. Um, so, I mean, now the audience, it's, you know, I, it's also, like I said, it's, you know, many people back then, 20 years ago, didn't know, you know, knew very little about the camps and many people now still don't know about the camps. So in that way, things have not changed, but even, you know, even when I, you know, I've been writing for 20 years now, publishing for 20 years, but I still, I don't really think about audience when I'm writing. I think if I did, it might kind of just freeze me up. <laughs> um, I try not to get too self-conscious during the writing process. I just try to remain, I call it being in the egg, you know, it's just this very safe womb-like place where I can make mistakes, get very, very messy on the page. And, and, and I, I have to think that nobody's watching me at all. And then once a manuscript is done and I put it out into the world, then, you know, I'm willing to listen to people. I'm willing to take criticism, um, you know, anything really to make the novel as good as it can be. And then I'm willing to, you know, to go out on the road and, and speak to people. And I love meeting audiences, um, but I don't really think about an audience during the actual writing process. Thank you for that. And that really, as a former educator myself, I, an elementary teacher, I, I was cautioned using the term children's books, um, just because I think the stories could, you know, go beyond, to be applicable to those beyond just children. Um, so your response, just your, your response very much reminded me of that. Yeah, so actually, actually, yeah. Um, I, okay. I remember one thing when I was in Seattle in 2005 that there was, I think, about 30 elementary school students. Do you remember this time from Lowell Elementary came to one of my readings? I, I think it was at the main library branch in Seattle. And I, at that point, I, it just it never occurred to me that young people would be reading my book at all. I thought I thought my audience probably would be older, you know, older Japanese Americans, but not young folks. So that was a surprise. Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, I'm I want to shift to talking about your characters. Um, the characters in a novel aren't given names, and that's very evident from those first few couple of pages. What were you trying to accomplish uh, by not naming those family members? Others had names, but not those family members. Yeah, you know, I work very intuitively, so I often don't know why I do what I do, but there's an earlier version of the first chapter of the novel in which the mother has a Japanese surname. So I'll call her Mrs. X, but she had a Japanese last name. And then as I continue to write about these characters, I noticed that I didn't give anybody else a name. So I went back and I unnamed the mother. But thinking about it later, I think that these are characters from whom everything has been taken, right? Their homes, their sense of self, their, their dignity, their liberty. And the one thing you cannot take away from somebody is their name. So only they and they alone know who they are. So they, I just want to leave them with some tiny shred of self. I also like the idea of a reader entering a story about a woman. You don't know her name. You don't necessarily know her race. She's just a woman who's about to go to the library to return a book. And then she suddenly sees the sign on, and it's an evacuation order. Um, although the reader doesn't know specifically what the sign says. And I think that's a situation that anybody of, you know, of, of any race can imagine themselves into. So it's not until full, a few pages in that you realize that the woman is Japanese American. So that was a way I think of kind of luring the reader into my story and hopefully at a certain point, I've just hooked them and they'll continue to read the novel. Yep, Macy, can I uh, come in for just a second? Because there, yes. there's a question that I forgot to ask uh, Julie. And uh, I noticed in the q and it's come up a couple of times. And, and the, the question, and, and Julie, you know, we, we had a conversation about this, uh, I think over email, but when, when you first heard about the book being uh, you rejected um, uh, as part of the curriculum in, in the school district, um, you know, I guess the question is, what was your response? I and mean, what, how did it make you feel? What were you thinking about when, when that happened? I, I mean, I was shocked, honestly. I was, I, I never encountered anything like this, you know, in 20 years of the book being out in the world. So at the same time, I don't think I was terribly surprised given the current moment that we're in. Uh, but I, I didn't really understand the language of the school board. You know, I, I feel like I'm telling it a very, very American story. I'm an American writer. Um, so I was very disappointed. At the same time, it was 
amazing to watch the response on the ground in Muskego, just to watch the local community rally, the, the parents and, and students just come out in opposition to the ban of the book and in support of the novel. And that would not have happened 80 years ago, right, Tom? I mean, 80 years ago, when the evacuation notices went up, nobody came to our defense. Neighbors just looked the other way. Politicians were clamoring for our removal. We were just very, very alone. Whereas in 2022, I feel like there were good people in the town of Muskego who were willing to come not only to our defense, but also who were willing to speak out and literally put their names on the line, sign a petition, show up with their bodies in person at a rally, just for the right to have the truth be told. And that to me was just very, very hopeful. No, no, I agree. Yeah, thanks, Macy. Go, continue. I just Absolutely. Went. Of course, yes, I think that was an important one. And that was actually a question that uh, we had uh, for you as well through the AAPI coalition. So I think uh, a lot of people are wondering that very same thing. Um, so in the final chapter, I know we don't have a whole lot of time. So um, in the final chapter, confession, as well as even the last couple of pages, well, um, well the father returns home. Its dramatic pace is a stark contrast from the slowly moving days in the lives of the mother and the children in the camp. Can you talk about this final chapter, Confession, and why, how you chose to end the book with that chapter? Yeah, that chapter was a gift from the writing gods. I, <laughs> I didn't know the whole time I was writing the novel how I would end the book. I knew I had to account for the father's voice in some way. And one day I just heard this very, very angry voice in my head and I just scribbled down the words as quickly as I could, but I knew that I'd found the right voice um, for the father. And I almost felt like I was channeling just his rage um, onto the page or channeling the rage of many, many men who had been, you know, who had been unfairly arrested and, uh, and just putting, putting this language on the page. And it came to me very quickly, which is unusual because I'm a very, very slow writer. And I got a lot of pushback actually from my editors initially about the angry tone of that last chapter. I was encouraged to tone it down, to rewrite it, to possibly to lop it off um, and to end the book very differently. Um, but I just, you know, I think that it wouldn't have been my book without that anger there. I think that for most of the book, it's just a kind of slow simmering buildup of nerves and there has to be a release to that tension somewhere. And I feel like it finally happens in that very last chapter with the father's kind of angry, sarcastic outburst. So I'm, I am glad that I, that I left the chapter in the way, the way that I wrote it. And, and I actually get more comments on that last chapter than I, than I think I do on, on any other of the other chapters of the novel. Thank you, Julie. Now, I, I feel like that I definitely have to ask a question related to some of the rise of anti-Asian hate crimes and sentiments. Um, so I, I, I had chills when I heard your just knowing how recent some of these events are, how close it is to your own family, um, sh you sharing the story of your families, you know, this, this book being so close to your own experiences and the experiences of your family. Um, and as a, a Hmong, as a child of a, a daughter of Hmong parents myself um, in being born in a refugee camp, um, I don't think people realize how recent many of our events have been. Um, and, and so that was, that was chilling to me. And so I think all the more reason, can you talk about the importance of remembering the Japanese American internment, especially in the context of the dramatic rise of anti-Asian hate crimes? Could these experiences happen again? Well, I feel like it is happening again. I mean, the emotional climate, I think, I don't know, Tom, what do you, I, think, I feel like the emotional climate now is, is quite similar to that after shortly after Pearl Harbor was bombed and just in terms of anti-Asian sentiment, right? Oh, you know, very much so. I think, in, and that's, you know, I think to the issue of why, um, you know, eventually we do what we do. I mean, it, it, it really is to, um, you know, yes, preserve this history, but what are the lessons that we can learn? And, and understanding that um, when these things happen, they're not isolated incidents just happening to one group one time, that there are patterns in our, in our society. And, and you know, I think during Ron's introduction, he, he mentioned something I, I say often is that, you know, history may not always repeat itself, but it often rhymes. And in particular, the last, you know, you know five or six years, um, um, you know, when we um, saw, 
you know, when when uh, you know Donald Trump uh, as a candidate first started um, um, campaigning, uh, you know, he would you know he would say things like you know Mexicans as and associating them as rapists and murderers, and and that was inter- I mean that was like a red flag because when you start using negative rhetoric against a, a group. Um, that was very similar to what happened to Asians in the you know, late 1800s, the early 1900s, and during World War II. And those words kind of lead to other things. And so it's understanding how, you know, what um, oftentimes people in the Jewish community talk about the pyramid of hate and how that works. To understand those things, you notice these things happening more in real time that you can respond to. So, and yes, the climate now, and, and I think in particular last several years has been very, very harsh and difficult uh, for us to all navigate, which makes it even more important that we have these discussions. Thank you, Tom and Julie. Oh gosh, I had so many more questions for you both and time has gone by so, so quickly. Uh, but I uh, I know that there were others who had questions as, as well. And I apologize to those whose questions we couldn't quite get to, uh, but I'm sure that there's gonna be a way that you could contact Julie um, and Tom uh, for with some of the questions you had, which are really good. But I must uh, now, um, we're gonna transition to closing because we just have a few minutes left. So thank you again, Tom and Julie. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lorna Young, and I'm a member of the AAPI Coalition of Wisconsin and co-chair of our education committee, uh, alongside MJ Wong Engel, who you met earlier. Thank you all for attending this webinar today. Many thanks to Julie Otsuka and Tommy Keda for your inspiring dialogue about the novel and sharing your personal stories. I will conclude this webinar by sharing some information about the AAPI community in Wisconsin, as well as how you can help us with our campaign to teach AAPI history in all Wisconsin public schools. Julie Atsuka's novel helps humanize the experiences of those affected by World War II incarceration of Japanese Americans, both then and now for their descendants. We hope that by hosting this webinar, our audience feels more informed about this dark chapter of our nation's history so that we can all grow in our understanding of how history is the background that shapes the context for us in today's world. While Japanese Americans are a small part of Wisconsin's AAPI population, learnings from their experience apply to any AAPI, BIPOC, and marginalized communities. As Asian Americans, we must not be silent when attempts are made to erase stories about our community struggles and resilience. Our stories, whether they be joyous or painful, are American stories. Asian American history is American history. The AAPI community has been invisible for so long in the US and in particular in Wisconsin. Our demographic profile differs significantly from the rest of the US. Did you know that the Hmong and Lao are the number one Asian origin group in Wisconsin? This is unlike many states in our two coasts, where people of Chinese descent are the number one AAPI group. The Hmong and Lao comprise over a quarter of Wisconsin's AAPI population, followed by people of East Indian and Chinese origin. We include those who are first, second, third, and even fourth generation family members. And most recently, Milwaukee is the home to the largest community of Burmese Rohingya refugees. Asian Americans are currently 4% of Wisconsin's population, but what is significant though, is that the AAPI community is about, is projected to be growing fast, particularly for school aged children. One of the ways we see this is that in some of our, that is that in some of our school districts, we have 10 to 20% AAPI in their K through 12 student population. We are proud to inform you that in January this year, the Wisconsin Association of School Boards Delegate Assembly, which includes all Wisconsin school districts, passed a resolution with a 70% yes vote. Encouraging Wisconsin school districts to develop educational curriculum and professional training to teach the history, culture, and contributions of AAPI to the economic, cultural, and social development of Wisconsin and the US. Whether our school districts are, have a large or small number of Asian American students, or whether they are in urban, rural, or suburban areas, an AAPI curriculum enhances the ability of all students to understand and navigate differences and collaborate with others. These are essential skills for all walks of life as our students enter the world beyond their school district. Um, so we ask you to, um, 
going forward, we invite you to join our coalition's campaign to require AAPI educational curriculum and lesson plans to be taught in the K through 12 grades throughout Wisconsin. While the WASB resolution that I just mentioned is a step forward, it is not a statewide law. In the past year, four states have passed laws requiring curriculum about AAPI history and culture, including our neighboring state, Illinois. Right now, there is a bipartisan bill in the Wisconsin legislature to amend a 1989 law known as Act 31 for it to include education about Hmong and other Asian Americans in our Wisconsin public schools. Act 31 currently states that at all grade levels an understanding of human relations, particularly with regard to American Indians, Black Americans, and Hispanics must be included in Wisconsin's instructional programs. We support this original law, but we note that Asian Americans are invisible in that 1989 law. That may have been an oversight back then, but is no longer excusable now. So we need your support. A bipartisan group of Wisconsin lawmakers are advocating for this bill to move to its public hearing stage. When it does, please join us in supporting this bill. Education is our most important and powerful tool to combat hate and promote empathy and understanding for all people. After this webinar, you'll see contact information for the AAPI Coalition of Wisconsin. Please email your ideas for how you can join us to advocate for AAPI educational curriculum in your local communities across Wisconsin and across the US. So in closing, on behalf of the coalition, thank you all for attending this webinar today. We look forward to working together going forward. And again, we thank Julia Tsuka and Tamakita for your insights today. And many thanks to Daniel Golden, owner of um, Boswell Book Company, for partnering with us to host this webinar.